everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, we are actually going to be learning of a feathery friend of ours because we are covering the oh so wonderful hummingbird. This animal suggestion has officially surpassed all of the others in terms of request frequency, so today's episode is of course a very special listener episode, not just dedicated to one of you, but to many. This episode is dedicated to Maria, which is Andre's grandmother, Olivia, Christine and her family, Kathy, Samantha, Julina, and Lynn. I hope all of you enjoy your episode, and you can all rejoice that there are people all over the world listening right along with you that are just as eager to learn about the hummingbird. If you want to request an animal on the show, you can do so in one of three ways. You can send a message to the Instagram Relax with Animal Facts. You can go to the website relaxwithanimalfacts.com and click on the Animal Request tab. And lastly, you can always send me an email at relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. So if you want to learn about a peculiar animal or one that you find very cool, please send an email. Don't be shy. I am always excited to open an email from you guys. I am just going to say where I got my facts from, and then we can jump right into the episode. For this episode, I got my facts from Britannica.com, HummingbirdCentral.com, TheSpruce.com. I also got some definitions from MerriamWebster.com, and lastly, of course, for the name, I went to etimonline. Dot com. All of the resources that are in this episode, all of the facts from the various articles are on those resources. They will be in the show notes or the description of this episode as they always are. And if you want to learn more, not just about the hummingbird, a lot of those resources will be invaluable to you. So if you wish to explore them, please do. And now I would like for all of you to notice maybe where you are carrying some tension. It truly is different for every person. For me, it's always in the hands and in the head. For you, it might be in the arms, it might be in the legs. Maybe you've been working really hard at training your carrier pigeon to request an animal that way, and you've gotten a little bit of a headache over it. But regardless of where you carry your specific tension, I would like for all of you to try to relax right alongside me as we go into the woodlands where the hummingbird resides. So what you were actually just listening to was the true humming of the hummingbird caused by their very, very quick flapping of their wings, and we're going to go more into that in just a second. Now, my neighbors are doing a little bit of construction work, so I hope it does not come into the background, but if it does, pretend as if it is somewhere in the distance in the woodlands. I can't choose when my neighbors decide to do things, unfortunately. The hummingbird is comprised of over 300, some articles say 320 species, and these hummingbirds are going to be small, brightly colored birds of the family Trochilidae. They have amazing and beautiful colors and elaborate and very specialized feathers, and this combination is what led a naturalist by the name of John Gould from Britain to attribute to many hummingbirds these exotic names that we still use today, like fairy hummingbird, sapphire hummingbird, topaz, sun gem hummingbird. Their feathers, their plumage is truly beautiful, 
and a hummingbird's brilliant throat color, for example, is not actually caused by feather pigmentation, but rather by something known as iridescence. So here we have a bunch of pretty big words, so let me just break them down. Iridescence refers to a lustrous rainbow-like play of color caused by differential refraction of light waves. What this is saying is that the hummingbird's throat color is not caused by the physical color of the feathers themselves, but rather by this process of iridescence or refraction of light waves off of their specific arrangement of feathers. And there's different factors in what kind of color you're going to get and the brightness of it, things like light level, moisture, what angle you're actually looking at the hummingbird from, and some other factors. All of these are going to influence how bright and colorful the throat of some of these hummingbirds will be. And speaking of their feathers, they have over 900 of them, which might sound like a lot, but actually it is the fewest number of feathers of any bird species in the world. So they get a gold medal not for a superfluous or excessive amount of feathers, but rather they take the gold medal from a lack of feathers. They do not need as many feathers because of course they are very small and we'll get into how small in just a moment. But also fewer feathers will help to keep them much more lightweight when they are flying and buzzing around. And they need to be lightweight. Roughly 25 to 30 percent of a hummingbird's weight is actually in its pectoral muscles, its chest. So these little birds are actually sort of downsized bodybuilders. They have these broad chest muscles that they use for flying. I wonder how much they could bench press if they were the size of a person. I think they would be putting many of us to shame. And an average hummingbird's heart rate is more than 1,200 beats per minute. Now, for you and me as human beings, of course, human beings will vary depending on age and different things like level of exercise and cardiovascular development. But on average, the human's heart rate is going to be between 60 to 100 beats per minute. So while the hummingbird's heart rate is beating away at 1,200 beats, we, in contrast, are walking with about 80 beats per minute on average. That is about 17 times faster than us. And not only is the heart rate going to be faster, but also other things are going to have to be faster as well. One of those is how fast they breathe. Of course, as the heart beats, oxygen is circulated through the body and heart rate is directly connected to breathing rate and different things like that. And at rest, a hummingbird will take an average of 250 breaths per minute, while their breathing pace will increase, of course, when they're in flight working out their pectoral muscles. We will typically be breathing about 16 times per minute on average. Of course, that also changes when we're exercising. But this massive contrast shows just how unique and cool the hummingbird is. So while there are more than 300 unique hummingbird species in the whole world, only 17 species are going to regularly breed in the United States of America. While some others may visit the country, about nine species, we can see that not many of them are actually in the U.S. The rest of the hummingbirds are primarily tropical species and will not usually migrate very far. They are going to be found in Central and South America, as well as throughout a lot of the Caribbean. So here in North America, we are missing out on more than 300 unique and exotic hummingbird species that are humming away in other parts of the world. 
So we mentioned that they were small, and they are. All of them are relatively small, but some are even minute. To put this in a little bit of a perspective, the giant hummingbird, the giant one, of Western South America is only about 20 centimeters or about 8 inches long, with a body weight of about 20 grams, that's about 0.7 ounces, and that will be less than even most sparrows. On the other side, we have the smallest species, which is known as the bee hummingbird. This hummingbird is in Cuba and the Isle of Pines, and will measure slightly more than 5.5 centimeters. So about 75% smaller than the giant hummingbird. These measurements do include the bill and the tail, and that is why this is as long as it is. Their bill and their tail is going to make up about half of this size. They will weigh about 2 grams, 10 times lighter than the giant hummingbird. And this species is the smallest living bird and will rank with the pygmy shrew as the smallest of warm-blooded vertebrates. And there is that word again, vertebrates. We covered in the last praying mantis episode what was an invertebrate, so if you remember the definition of an invertebrate, a vertebrate might be a little bit easier to understand. A vertebrate is an animal that has a backbone. So the praying mantis is an invertebrate because it does not have one, while the hummingbird is a vertebrate because it does. But despite this very small size of the hummingbird, they are indeed one of the most aggressive bird species there is. They will very regularly plan their assaults on jays, hawks, crows that will just happen to infringe on their territory. Anyone who has a backyard bird feeder might find that if there's a hummingbird and a big dominant hummingbird, they will guard these feeders and make sure to chase intruders away. They are not big on sharing. So if it has not already been spoiled, we are going to spoil it now in terms of the name of the hummingbird. We are going to be going a little bit more in depth with the word humming and hum in the etymology section, but this is very hard to avoid. The beat of their wings is so rapid, as we saw, up to 55 times in a single second that a sort of humming sound is going to be produced, and the wings will appear very blurred. They are the only bird species that can hover in mid-air and also fly backwards or even upside down. The ability to sort of suspend themselves in mid-air is going to really help the hummingbird in getting the nectar of plants and flowers. It can stay itself and use its beak like a straw and draw in all of that wonderful nectar that it is looking for. So while they have these tremendous capabilities in the air, a hummingbird can't actually walk or hop like many other bird species. What they can do is shuffle with its very, very short legs, which are not very strong. So we see that while it is very incredible in the air, there is a sort of takeaway on the ground. And this all plays into their anatomical structure. The hummingbird has this very compact, incredibly muscular body, and these pretty long and very blade-like wings that, unlike other wings of other birds, the hummingbird's wings are going to connect to the body only at the shoulder joint. One of the advantages of this sort of organic architecture is that it will help this bird to fly not only forward, but also straight up and down, sideways, backwards, and to hover as it does. So we learned of all of the amazing ways in which it can fly, 
And the reason it can do that is because of how the wing is attached to the body, only at the shoulder joint. One interesting fact is that the hummingbird actually does not have any sense of smell. They make up for it in the realm of vision. They do have very adept and keen eyesight. But when they are going face first into feasting on a flower, they are not actually smelling the flowers as we might when we walk through a park or something like that. And the reason we see them going face first right into flowers is because their diet consists of primarily nectar from those flowers. And they are seen going most often to red flowers. So some researchers have concluded that red is their favorite color. So if red is your favorite color, you share that with the hummingbird. But apart from nectar, they will also eat small insects like aphids and spiders and sometimes even pollen and sap. And you may be asking yourself, is there a difference between nectar and pollen? And the answer is yes. Nectar is a sweet substance that is going to be produced by some plants and flowers, of course, are included. This nectar, this sweet substance is made to attract pollinators that will include bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Pollinators are those that come to these plants and by consequence of, say, taking nectar from them or something else that the plant or flower is offering, they will take with them genetic material from the plant and they will, by proxy of getting their food, they will also be reproducing more of the flower, possibly after their whole digestive process has finished, or maybe it will spread a different way onto the ground. Pollinators and plants have this symbiotic relationship of helping one another. The hummingbird gets to eat the sweet nectar, and the flower gets to expand itself. And then pollen is this fine powder of particles that are microscopic that can fertilize a flower to produce a seed or seeds in the flower's ovary. So this pollen is going to be produced by these plants and these pollinators, including the hummingbird, will transfer it to another flower just by going and feeding on another one. It is a wonderful balance that happens, but they will be eating this nectar, insects, and sometimes pollen or sap in small meals and many small meals throughout the day. They will be consuming up to 12 times their own body weight in nectar each day. They need those calories to fuel those pectoral muscles. In terms of a hummingbird's lifespan, in the wild they have to deal with things like hail, rain, snakes, wind, just cold weather, squirrels, cats, dogs. So they do have a good amount of natural predators. So because of this and other man-made factors, most deaths in the hummingbird is going to occur in the first year of life. But the record age of one banded, ruby-throated hummingbird is about 6 years and 11 months. So they do have a capacity to live longer than one year, but the obstacles that they face make that a bit of a challenge. So for those of you that know much about bird species as a whole or as a general rule, birds are typically going to pair up one with another. But hummingbirds don't actually do this. What happens is the male and the female will go their own way after the mating process is complete. The male will immediately move on to other females and the female is responsible for building the nest, incubating the eggs and raising the young birds. So definitely not common. Many bird species will have the male and the female paired up for life as they raise their young, but in the case of the hummingbird, they do it another way. 
So the nest that the female is going to be working on is basically a tiny cup of these collected plant fibers. Those will be joined with and in conjunction with spider webs, lichens, and moss that is attached to a branch. They might use a large leaf, a forked twig here and there, or maybe even a rock ledge. In one species of hummingbird, known as the hermit, the nest is hung by a narrow stalk from the underside of a ledge, or sometimes from the roof of a cave or a culvert. The nest cup will be set on one side of a mass of mud and plant material. It is going to be held level by a careful weighting, that is weighting as in W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, of the other side of the mass. So hummingbirds are not just fantastic flyers, they are well schooled in the field of classical mechanics and physics, as well as a little bit of architecture to make these ornate and very well balanced nests, at least the hermit hummingbird does. And now we're going to move on to the final fact of the hummingbird, which is the name, where does it come from? So we know the name hummingbird is attributed to them because of the sound of the humming made by the very rapid flapping of their blade-like wings. But we are going to dig a little bit deeper into the words humming and hum. The word humming, which is an adjective, meaning that it describes a noun. So you could say, Steph Wolf is a humming podcast host. But this adjective humming is seen first in the 1570s, describing something that hums. And it was taken from the verb hum, which meant brisk, vigorous, energetic, from the 1680s. The hummingbird was first named the hummingbird as early as the 1630s. So we can see how the hummingbird can be seen as brisk, vigorous, and energetic. After all, with the speed with which it flaps its wings, and how fast it breathes, and how fast its heart beats, they truly are vigorous and energetic, and also incredibly brisk creatures. And that word, hum, in the verb form, is first seen in the 14th century, homen, which was first described as making a murmuring sound to cover embarrassment. But then later, homen was changed to hummen, and it took on the new meaning of to buzz or to drone in the early 15th century. So that buzzing droning sound, that humming sound that we attribute to the hummingbird, we can see its very clearly defined origins and how apt it is as a distinction for our very beautifully colored friend. Now we are going to move on to the portion of the show in which I read a review from one of you special listeners out there that very kindly wrote a review. In this case, it is almost always on Apple Podcasts. And this episode, we are going to be reading a review from a user named CLBW9876. And CLB is writing all the way from the United States of America, where they do have some of these wonderful creatures that we learned about today. And CLB writes, This podcast helps me fall asleep so much. There are so many animals that we can listen to. I have learned so much from you. For nighttime, your soft, slow voice is soothing. Thanks so much. Thank you for the kind words, CLB. I'm so happy that the show can help you as it does in terms of your nightly routine. It is so amazing that the podcast is used in as many different ways as it is. For an example, one of the families that requested the hummingbird today loves to listen to the podcast on these long road trips and things like that. And some, like you, CLB, use it to fall asleep. 
I have yet to be informed of anybody listening to the podcast as they are working out. That would truly be something. If you want to leave a review like CLB did, you are very much encouraged to do so. It is one of the single most impactful ways to give back to the show and to help it grow. So any of you that do in the future, any of you that have already left a review, it means the world. But just know, as I always say, that you keeping me good company as we go, in this case, into the woodlands is gift enough. Anything apart from that is all extra and comes from your generosity. Again, if you want to learn about an animal that you find super cool, make sure to reach out to the show by sending a message to Relax With Animal Facts on Instagram, going to the website relaxwithanimalfacts.com and going to the Animal Request tab, or you can always send an email directly to me by emailing relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. I can see now why this episode, The Hummingbird, was requested so fervently. What a truly fascinating creature and one of the most unique of the bird species that I have seen or learned about and certainly one of the coolest of the birds that we have covered on the show. Thank you all for your suggestions. Thank you all for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this podcast episode, and I hope that you will all join me on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.